question, could our biology teacher then not teach the Declaration of Independence? What? That's the most important document in American history. Yeah, but doesn't the document say we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are... Uh-oh! What's the verb you just read? Created equal? Oh no! Does this mean our biology teacher can no longer teach or talk about the Declaration of Independence? Uh-oh! Equal. What does that mean? Now, that's an interesting word. Does equal here mean same? Because here's the problem with the word equal being same. We're not all the same. Some of us are tall and some of us are not so tall. Some of us can run really fast and some of us not so fast. We're not all the same. In fact, when you look at us, we're all quite different. What does it mean to say we hold these truths to be self-evident and all men are created equal? What did Jefferson mean by this? The consensus has usually meant this. Write it down for your notes. That all humans are created equal under the law. This will be one of the first and earliest American statements of equal rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Look at the next one. And that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What is an unalienable right? What does that mean? Cannot be taken away. Unalienable cannot be taken away. Question, if you cannot take away these rights, why do you have to write about it? it? Seems that the argument really that Jefferson is making is these rights should not be taken away. He's going to make the argument that George III, the King of England, has taken away or removed these rights. Okay, so we hold these truths to be self-evident. It gets dark at night obvious. What are those truths? One, all humans are created equal. Two, they are given, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Wow, this begs a really interesting question. Can you believe in rights and not believe in the creator who gives those rights? Where do these rights come from? For Jefferson, they are endowed, given by a creator. Well, what if you don't believe in a god or a creator? Can you still believe in rights? And if you do believe in human rights without a creator, where do those human rights come from? Interesting. Study of this text can raise all kinds of interesting questions. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these, uh-oh, did you see the word among? These are not all of the rights, which is why we had to have the Bill of Rights. What are the major rights for Jefferson? Look at them. We'll want to write them down. And then we want to define them in our own words. What are the three major rights that he speaks of? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Let's put it in our own words. What does the right to life mean? Normally it's understood to me that the government does not have the right to take away your life uh, without just cause without just cause. Okay. What about liberty? What does that mean? Well, normally it's been understood that liberty here is our word freedom. That is to say, you have a natural right to do what you want as long as it does not violate others' freedom, liberty, rights. Finally, did you notice that Jefferson did not say you have the right to happiness? That is not what he says. He says you have the right to the pursuit of happiness. What does the word pursuit mean to you? Right, to go after, doesn't it? Right, to go after, to find it. In other words, Jefferson never said you have the right to be happy. He said you have the right to have the chance to be happy. Finally, don't you find it amazing? I certainly do that in an essay of this magnitude and importance, the word happiness gets used two times. Isn't that fascinating? And it says something about America, that in its most important essay, Jefferson uses the word happy twice. Who are Americans? Jefferson will say, among other things, we're a bunch of people that just want to be happy. 
that's very interesting to me. It says something about the American colonialists that they had no problems with the word happiness, to be happy. It does beg a really interesting question. When was the last time that you were happy? How do you define being happy? Some have said happiness is attaining a goal of my own choosing. You might write that definition down. It's an interesting, the attainment of a goal of my own choosing. I am happy when I have done that. And therefore, I should have the right to try to find ways to make myself happy as long as it does not violate other people's rights. I, for example, might say, dude, I'm most happy when I'm putting a 45 bullet in your brain. Way wrong answer, Jefferson will say, and here's why. The person whose brain you want to put a bullet in, he or she also has certain unalienable rights. We all must cohabitate together. How will we cohabitate together? We hold these truths. And Jefferson's going to answer that question. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Look at the next that. And some of my students have said, wow, this is very interesting. Look what he says next. That to secure, hold on, to these rights, governments are instituted among men. Deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't brain drain here. What you just read is powerful, powerful language. Everybody knows it gets dark at night, obviously. Everybody knows that there's certain kind of rights that we all have. These are God-given rights. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, to hold on to these rights... Government instituted, made up among men, deriving their just consent from the governed. If Jefferson were to come today and hear somebody say, dude, I hate the government, on the government, he would be stunned. He'd be like, what are you talking about? You hate the government. You don't understand. You are the government. Jeffersonian view of democracy. You want to write this down. Jefferson says it's very simple. Government has one and only one job to do, and it is to secure the rights of the governed. Well, who are the governed? You. Jefferson will say, you are the governed. You decide how those rights will be secured. Why has he said that? Well, look at the next that phrase. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Follow what he's done. Hey, it gets dark at night, obvious. Everybody knows. Anybody with a brain knows. We all have rights. Some of those rights are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And the government's job is to secure those rights. And everybody up to this point who's reading this, are you ready for this? Including British audiences in Parliament. We'll go. You're absolutely right about that. That is what government is supposed to do. But what happens? Look at the next part of it. What happens when government becomes destructive of these ends? What happens when government no longer secures these rights? It is, did you see what he says? The right of the people to do what? Destroy the government. That is not what he says. You didn't read it close enough. Go back and look at it again. I am teaching you how to read closely. It is the right of the people. What does he say? I hope you've written it in your notes. It is the right of the people to do what? First, two A words. Do you see it? I hope you've written them in your notes. It's the right of the people to what? I'm at the top of, of 113. It is the right of the people to alter and then abolish. Hey guys, I hope that you sit up and you are paying close attention here because you are looking at genius. Jefferson is going to make an argument that is pristine. You would have to be a complete idiot, he says, to not agree that everybody's got rights. Life, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And government's job is to protect those rights. Correct? 
and everybody reading this goes, here, here, you're absolutely right. That when government no longer protects those rights, it is the right of the people to alter the government. But what if you try to alter the government and it fails? You have only one left choice. That's the other A word. Abolish. Now all Jefferson has to do is to show that the colonialists tried to alter the present form of government with England. All he has to do is show. Dude, we tried to talk with these people. They would not listen to us. We have no choice. We're going to have to declare independence. We have no choice. In other words, Jefferson is saying, it's not like we're all going, yippee, we get to throw mom and dad out. Uh, uh, uh. That's not this. This is, we don't have a choice. We've tried to work with these guys. We tried to alter. Now the government is no longer protecting our rights. Do We do not have a choice. Look how he says it. It is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety, <laughs> and there it is again, and their happiness. Government does two things for Jefferson. One, provides safety. Two, provides happiness, or the potentiality of the pursuit of happiness. And that is what government does. And English readers will say, you're absolutely right, that's what government's supposed to do. Well, what if the colonists can argue that government no longer is doing that? In other words, what if British power has made colonists feel that they no longer are safe. They no longer are happy and secure. Now we're going to watch a conceding of a point. Let's go to it. What do we mean when we say conceding a point? We, again, remind you, we say something the acrimonious audience is going to agree with, and then we're going to follow it up with what word? But. Take a look at how he does it. He says, prudence... I hope you're reading with me on page um, uh, 113. Prudence indeed will dictate. Prudence, wisdom, wisdom, justice, wisdom. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. You don't get up in the morning and just decide to change your government. Would British Parliament agree or disagree with that view? You don't get up in the morning and just say, hey, today I know, let's just change our, totally change our government. No, you don't mess around with government. You don't mess around with rules like that. But look at how he follows that concession of a point. He says, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all evidence has shown that, God, that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. People don't jack with their government. People will put up with a lot of stuff to keep their own government. That's a conceding a point. All British readers would agree with that. They'd go, you're absolutely right about that. Look at the next word, though. I hope you're reading close. I'm, I'm engaging in close reading of this text. But, do you see it? But... When a long train of abuses and usurpations, to usurp means to try and take over and be a tyrant, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces or shows a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, tyranny. Hitler, in our, in our 20th century mentality. In other words, trying to be the big boss. Whenever that happens, look what he says. It is their, do you see that? I hope you're reading it with me. It is their right. It is their, whoa, hope you write that one in your notes. The D word. It is their duty to re, notice what he says, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. He's writing as much to colonialists who are on the fence, who say, whoa, 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 this messing around with British, I don't know, man, they got a lot of ships. And they did. Notice what he says. It's a very simple argument. Government's job is to protect our rights. When government no longer does that, 
It is our right, it is our duty to get rid of that. Oh. Such has been, I hope you're reading with me, such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies. Notice he calls them patient. And such is now the necessity which constrains us. Notice that goes with the word necessity and impels, doesn't it? In other words, we don't have a choice here. We have to do this. We don't have a choice to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having a direct object, the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid, watching world. Follow the argument. It's a brilliant one. It is absolutely brilliant. He says, if you're going to bust up and bust away and dissolve political bands, you better give good reasons why. There's stuff everybody knows. Government's job is to protect and secure rights. Life, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. When government no longer does that, it's the right, it's the duty of the people. We have no choice. We have a choice to create a new form of government. The only thing remaining for Jefferson is to now prove that England's king, George III, has in fact done all of the things that will be listed next. Notice the word he now will be repeated over and over again. He has refused his assent to laws. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws. He has refused to pass other laws. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual. He has dissolved. Who is this he? George III, King of England. And all Jefferson now has to do is to say, these are all the things that this cat has done to us. Leaving Spaniards and French intellectuals to ask, French, ask Englishmen, did he really do this? Yes. Well, he didn't do this, though. Yes, he did this. Yes, he did that. Well, then these guys got no choice. This amazing list will go on to page 1114. It continues on and on and on. And finally on to page 1115. How serious are these guys? I hope you're reading with me again. We're back to the pronoun we. We... Therefore, I'm, I'm in the last two paragraphs now on page 1115, or 115. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection with them in the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may have right to do. And for the support, read it closely, this is the essence of patriotism. They're telling the parents, they're done. It's over. The Revolutionary War was won in language before it was ever won with bullets. Because British parliamentary members had to read this essay and go, I, I see what they're saying. I see what they're saying. But how serious were they? The people who signed this document had to read this last phrase. I hope you're reading it with me on, on 115. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Notice how many times in this essay God is mentioned. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Are you ready for this stat? The guys that signed this essay all signed it as millionaires are close to it. And they all died completely broke. England took everything that the signers of these of this comment of this essay took everything they had. Many of them hunted down and hung as terrorists and traitors. 
They knew what was coming, and they signed it anyway. How do you explain that fact? How do you explain the fact that these signers were willing to sacrifice everything? The answer, the only answer, is courage, isn't it? They had some sense. They knew they were right, and they knew there was a future, but it had to be as an independent nation. Let's now go ahead in our final moments and listen to a professional reading of the Declaration of Independence. You now have enough background that you ought to be able now to follow along closely. It takes about nine minutes for this reading, and so I want you to stay focused. As we finish now our conversation together with the Declaration of Independence, the thing I really want you to focus on are all of those he, he, he. Because when it comes time to take an exam over this text, that's where a number of the questions are going to be drawn. Put it in your notes this way. What has George III really done that's so terrible? That's all this listing of these he, he, he. And as you read this now, the question is, what's so bad that he's done? And the answer for you will be listed right here. Here we go, the Declaration of Independence. I hope that you can sit up, pay attention now, follow this thing. The Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the rights of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representatives' houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected 
whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasions from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas, to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them, as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, 
appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. In the history of the world since 1776, any time a subjugated peoples have decided that it was time to try to make a statement, they always go back to this document as the pattern. They look at it as a work of brilliant rhetorical persuasive prose, where Jefferson sets up the argument of what government should do, and all he has to do is to show what government has not done. And then, the American Revolutionary War. Does it work? I would make this argument, you're sitting here. And for that fact, you have much to thank for this document. And the courage that it took to sign off on this document. And then, of course, to be willing, in many cases, to die for that, for that signature that you put there. Fifty years later, after this document was written, Jefferson would take his last breath to the day. A fascinating statement in history. Well, there you go, an introduction to the Declaration of Independence and persuasive writing. I hope that you've learned one or two things about both America and persuasion. Thank you.